Hello, everybody. Here we are at chessstars.com, and it's Live Lecture Thursday. And we have for you correspondence expert Michael Hofer, who is a correspondence master and has some information for you about Fisher's contribution to opening theory. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, well, hello again, everyone. How are you guys doing today? Okay. I want to start out with um, Bobby's repertoire, his secret weapon. You know, all the grandmasters got together one time and prepared a player to defeat him with the French. Uh, one of the ways to avoid the main lines of the French, or even the Sicilian, is the King's Indian attack. So, Bobby started this out with E4, and he's playing Lom Surin, Miag in the Seuss Interzonal 1967. Lom Surin played C5. Now, you're probably going to play the same seven moves no matter what black does, but the move order does matter. It's going to be e4, knight f3, g3, bishop g2, castles, and knight b to d2. Now, knight b to d2 is only essential when black plays d5, and that's to make sure that the queens don't come off the board. And actually, if uh, black doesn't go for a d5 break, then knight b d2 might be omitted. So, Bobby did not tip his hand, played knight f3. Magma Surin played e6, and now d3. And d3 has to be played now. And the pawn to d5 signals that the knight has to go to d2. Magma Surin played knight c6, and now white's task is easy here, just Fianchetto and castle. Knight f6, bishop g2. Bishop e7, castles, and now, black castle. Now, white could have played the e5 break, but you really want to wait until black has castled. That break can be premature, but once black has determined where his king is residing, the e5 break is extremely powerful. And of course, Bobby did it right here. Knight to d7, attacking e5. So rookie one is not only protecting e5, it's part of the plan. White's plan right now is to get as many pieces in touch with the square e5 as possible to make that square radioactive and then transfer that energy over to the king side for a king side attack. Because that e5 move is like a karate chop. It has cut the board in two. Black's plan is to merrily expand on the queen side. White's plan is to mate black, uh, Black's king. I'm always confused as to why Black would subject himself to this. But actually, until Fisher made some innovations in the king's Indian, this was a popular plan. And uh, Black was doing quite well with it. And there it is, merrily expanding on the queen side with b5. Knight f1, that knight is going to either e3 or h2 with the idea of getting to g4 where he can overprotect the square e5. A very Nimzovich type uh, way of playing. Merrily expanding on the queen side while he's getting mated on the king side. Now h4. H4 is a very important move. We want to play bishop f4, but if we played bishop f4 right away, black would play g5 and chase the bishop away. Now, while it looks kind of weird to push pawns on the king side when the center is closed, he can certainly do that, and the attack is completely gone after that. So the whole purpose of h4 is to enable bishop f4. It's part of the plan of overprotecting the square e5. It also gives uh, the possibility of pushing the h-pawn to h5 and h6, but that's really not our plan. B4. We're going to talk about a4 in, the, uh, in a couple of games.
White continues with the plan. Bishop f4. A4. And now this is a very, very important moment in the game. White had actually been losing these positions until Fisher came up with a novelty here that revolutionized chess theory. He says he spent more time on this move than any other move in the game. 15 minutes. Considering some of the sacrifices in this beautiful game, that's rather remarkable. It also indicates that he actually came up with this over the board. So, anybody have any ideas what the move is? Revolutionary move that revolutionized chess. Nobody wants to take a guess? All right. Well, the move is a3. Now, you don't normally want to push pawns on the side of the board where you're weak. Now, if you can make one economical move that totally stops what the other guy's trying to do, then it makes sense, and that's exactly what Bobby did here. After a3, black really has nothing on the queen side. So, Miyagamasaran took. Bobby takes back. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention. Let's go back a couple of moves. The A3 move is important because otherwise black is going to play A3, which would virtually force white to play B3, and he'd have significant holes in his queen side. So that's why A3 is a very, very important move. Knight A5, much ado about nothing. Knight E3 with the possibility of going to g4 again over protecting e5 bishop a6 black finally gets his uh, locked bishop developed bishop h3 now this was a very remarkable move uh, this cryptic sortie of the bishop is a trademark of fishers from this game and it's very, very useful. Um, does anyone know the main reason white is playing bishop h3? Feel free to text. Well, the whole point of bishop h3 is to get in knight g5. And then... Black, being a Sicilian player and a French player, is used to getting attacked. They probably read the book, Sacrifices in the Sicilian. And they could be very worried that we're going to play bishop takes e6, f takes e6, knight takes e6, forking the queen and the rook, and picking up an exchange. But that is not at all what we have in mind. No way, Jose. The whole point of knight g5 is to get as many pieces as possible flooding over to the king's side for a mating attack. As Yasser Sarawan used to say, you can tell if an attack works by counting the material forces on that sector of the board and using the king as three and a half for defensive purposes. Wherefore, right now black's got five for the rook, eight, eight and a half with the king, eleven and a half with the pawns, and the other bishop, let's give uh, another uh, 3.5 for that just to make it even 17 and 26 with the queen. Uh, that's a lot, a lot of stuff to get over there, but it's very possible after knight g5. So, Miyagmasurin played d4, and Bobby's going backwards. Normally, you don't want to do this, normally, you want to go to g4. And I was very struck by this move. This is a very famous game. Fisher has played zillions and zillions of King's Indian attacks since he was a little kid. Zillions of blitz games. He could probably play it in his sleep. He probably knew right here that mate is a forced issue. So he just knew where his pieces can reside. But it does look like uh, White is giving up ground here. Knight b6, and now the ubiquitous knight g5, another very important move. 
the center is locked and all the weiss pieces are flying over to the king side to hopefully uh, get a mating attack this game is pretty close though knight d5 hitting our treasured bishop at uh, f4 a very disturbing development indeed again bobby has to move backwards again it looks like white is giving up ground Again, it looks like this little-known player from Mongolia may be winning the game. Bishop takes g5. Well, that's just not a very good move. Playing Fisher. Miag Masurin may have cracked under the pressure. I played this opening for many, many years. And I know that whenever black gives up the dark squared bishop, there's trouble in River City. He is going to get mated. So uh, he's going to be just way too weak on the dark squares. And what Fisher does with his dark squared bishop here is very instructive. Bishop takes g5. Queen d7. And, of course, queen h5. A wonderful position indeed but what Fisher has in store is quite remarkable Rook c8 and what black wants to do is shove the, the c pawn and maybe get a queen knight d2 hmm normally the knight goes to h2 and g4 what does Bobby have in mind Knight c3, nice post for the knight. Bishop f6. <clears throat> what a brilliant move. Considering he took 15 minutes on a3, I can only imagine how much time he put on bishop f6. But again, this guy has been playing chess and playing this position all his life. If Bobby made a sacrificial move like that against me, I, I don't even think I'd waste the analysis time looking at it because he ha has it all figured out. But uh, why can't black take the bishop, guys? Let's look at a variation. Let's see. How do we do this? Takes. We take back. And what is black force to do here? Well, if he doesn't play king h8, he's going to get mated. So, how does white continue? <clears throat> I'll bet you get this, Nanad. How does white get in? Any knight f3? Nope, that doesn't work. Rook e5? Nope, that doesn't work either. Bishop g2? Nope. He took less than 15 minutes on this. Nope. <clears throat> E6. Bishop F5. Peter Murray. Winner, winner. Chicken dinner. Good job, Peter. Outstanding, brother. Bishop F5. Threatening meat. Well, black has to take, and now the rest is pretty obvious. Right, guys? Rook E7 hitting the queen. Queen's got to go back here. Rook takes. Queen comes over to stop mate, and bam, say goodnight. So, you know, this is the stuff that didn't even happen in the game. Quite remarkable. So let's get back to the game. Bishop f6, and Miyagma Cern, to his credit, did not even consider taking that, I imagine. He played a very fine move. <clears throat> 
In fact, it's the only move. It's the only move that uh, continues the game and keeps Black in it. And it was rookie eight. I mean, queenie eight. Okay. So it looks like Black has parried all of White's threats. And he's got a pretty good uh, setup over there on the queen side. So how does White continue? Holy Hawkeye. Really? So Bobby threatened a peace sack, and now he's trading pieces. We all know that uh, liquidation of pieces during an attack leads to total devastation, and the uh, power usually runs out of the attack. So it's kind of unusual for this to happen. But Bobby has a plan. And this plan dangles by a thread. G6. Yeah, that's probably not a very good move. The guy already gave up his dark squared bishop. And now he's creating holes on the dark squares. He should have played uh, bishop b7. Let's, let's take that back. He should have gone here. Does anybody see a good move though on that? Another remarkable move. White would play, bishop takes, g7. And that's pretty interesting. Anyway, I don't want to use all our time on one game. So, we'll go back to g6. And da, da, oh, I got to hit resume thing. There we go. Okay, well, it's not too hard to figure out that the queen's got to stay in front of the king. And if she goes to h6, black easily plays queen f8. And the queen trade is not at all what white has in mind. Knight takes knight. Now, how do we recapture, guys? This one's pretty easy. Of course, we take with the rook. And it's, that's very important. Bobby has plans for that rook. Does anyone know where that rook is going? If you understand this one game and all of its themes, you can really have a shot at starting out with the King's Indian attack and not having to know a lot of theory because you know where the pieces belong. That's the beautiful thing about this opening. Right, very good, Nina. So, uh, Black goes to get his queen. H5 for sure. Takes. And what does white do? What would you do if you were white? Anybody have any ideas? Yes. Yes, Nainod. Oh, my goodness. Look how close this is. Rook H4. What a Beautiful, brilliant move. Queen h6, mate. Well, it's not quite that easy. Miagma Surin saw there was a storm brewing over on the king's side. So he did indeed lift his rook. Bishop g2. Threatening mate. That may be the most elegant move in this entire brilliant game. Who in the heck knows these positions well enough to know you got to play bishop g2 and threaten mate? That that is needed to get this mate to work. It's just a beautiful, beautiful game. Bishop g2, threatening mate. Miagma Surin is about to get a queen. Wow. Has Bobby screwed up? I wonder if people watching this game actually thought that Fisher might be losing at, at, at any point. Queen h6. And then uh, has already tipped us off to the rest. 
queen of fate. And now this is maybe the most beautiful uh, position in chess history. I, I think the other uh, companion to this would be uh, Taimanov Nidorf, Zurich, 1953. On the flip side, in the King's Indian Defense. This position used to be printed on T-shirts. Uh, they should make those again. In fact, I might want to make those again. That This was really cool. So, yep, no matter what, uh, Miyagi Masurin resigned because no matter what he does, you know, let's give me a useful move. Do we have a useful move? Well, queen takes h7, king takes, and there are no useful moves because of double disco check. And if the king goes to g8, rook h8 is mate. So king takes pawn, and here it is. That bishop to g2 was necessary because of bishop e4 mate. Now, I'm going to go to one of my games that was a correspondence game where we had a very similar position and my opponent played the alleged improvement on Fischer Miyag Masurin. Uh, that, this is one of my favorite games of all time. So let's go to games and... I don't see the game here. Oh, my goodness. Well, 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 well. This is not good. I thought I saved it. Okay. Well, I'm just going to have to enter the whole darn thing. That's no problem. All right. Okay. That would be back at move 13. All right, can we go back to move 13? Here we go. All right. <clears throat> so we got the same position. And now rather than uh, frivolously taking the pawn and ending up with nothing on the queen side, my opponent... Thank you, Victor. That's very, very kind of you. My opponent played the alleged improvement, bishop a6. And I'm very, very proud of this game. I mean, I have shamelessly ripped off Bobby Fischer from my entire chess career and reaped incredible dividends. And I used a lot of his themes in this game, but I did find one of my own that I was very, very proud of. And it probably would be the move that would go on my tombstone as uh, one of my innovations. And it's kind of cool I don't have the game in here. Because you guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys a chance to find it. So, wherefore? What's, what's the idea for us to play now? Uh, I'm sorry. I did it on the wrong move. I knew I did something wrong. It's here. I'm, I'm so dumb. Okay, it was on this move, and I have to restore. Okay. <sighs> sorry about that, guys. Okay. I think I got this. Yeah, bishop a6 here. Okay, we're good. <sighs> All right. Now, how do we continue? 
and 83. And then my opponent played a4. And of course now we use Fisher's move a3. And he played bishop b5. This is the whole idea behind bishop a6. This is actually supposed to be an improvement. Well, I was and still am unimpressed. So, anybody have an idea how to uh, refute that? There's two guys out there that I expect to, to know the answer to this. One of them is Ragov, the other is Nanon. Nanon, I know you know this one. No, 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 too early, too early, too early, son. We have to play C4. Now, I didn't invent this move, but it's a really cool move. Very good, Nanon. Yes. And he took on Passant, and voila. We have the same pawn structure as Fisher Miyagi Thurin, only he's got a stupid bishop on b5 that is doing about as much. Well, I guess it's doing a little bit more than it was on c8, but not much. And now my opponent, I can't believe he played this move <clears throat> in a correspondence game. This is actually a horrific move. Yet, if my opponent didn't play this goofy move, nah, it's goofier than that. We wouldn't have uh, one of my better moves later on. He played c4. Totally, totally goofy. And it's really about the only bad move he played in the game. Yeah, of course. Karate chop. Bam! Boom! Cut the board in two. Talk about having a mating attack. Yet, I did have some sleepless moments in this game. He played knight a5. I don't understand all this. He's playing knight b3 to the ghost town. I don't know what his plan is. But, you know, look at his pieces. So now, now what do we do? Ragov, I expect you to know this one. No, 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 no. Bishop g5? What are we, merchants? No. Yes. Ding, ding, ding. Good job, Ragov. Bishop h3. And black played rook b8. Not a horrific move. Makes sense. And now why did we play bishop h3? Why did Bobby play bishop h3. What's up with the cryptic sortie of the bishop to h3? Right. Boom! Knight g5. Alright. And my opponent played a pretty cool move here. Oh, no, no, no. No, I did get knight d5 against Boris Kogan, though. Uh, but that's when the, when the queen is on c7. Uh, that's a stock sacrifice in the King's Indian attack. When they play queen c7, you can sack your knight at d5, and when they take, push the e-pawn and have the discovery of the bishop f4. It is not totally easy, but it is cool. It's the only time I ever beat Boris Kogan. I was stunned. Anyway, um, Mr. G. Nutsi from Brooklyn Heights, played rook b6. And as I was saying, he might have been concerned that I was going to play bishop takes e6, f takes e6, knight takes e6, forking the queen and a rook. But not at all what I had in mind. Of course, we continue with. This move is as natural as a baby's smile. 
Queen C2? No! No. How can you play Queen takes H7 if the Queen... Well, yeah, you can. Uh, no. I had a different plan. And it's essential, I think, that the Queen goes to H5. Yeah, but you might be right. Maybe Queen C2 works, but I play Queen H5. And the reason I played this is because my opponent was about to take a one-month vacation. And I didn't want him getting any edges. <clears throat> so I wanted to have the card in his mailbox. Marty is telling me something. I don't know. Oh, I can look at my phone. I'm getting a comment I can't see and still tape. Okay. I wanted to uh, make a move so that he would have a forced only move. And then I'd have a surprise for him. So, of course, yes, he had to play H6. So his month off, um, that's what he gets. And then what do we do? I'm very, very proud of this move. Rogov, do not tell anyone. How do we continue the attack? Is there any way? No. No, 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 no. No. Bobby backed his pieces up. I didn't. Rogov, you're not even right. Rogov, you know the move. We talked about it the other night. Don't, don't say anything uh, 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 for the next few moves, Rogov. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. We must be more effective. Nope. No bishop. You know, that was a nice try, Marty. This is the thing I love about correspondence chess, where you can really tell if an attack is going to work. You got the time to work it out. Now, when this game was played, I think it was 1987, engines weren't very good. They were only like 2,200. And this, this position is like 2,900. Trying to figure out a force mate. No, keep trying, guys. Pretty soon you're going to run out of moves. You have to have a plan. You have to figure out where the pieces belong, and then you have to figure out how to get them in. You guys are just guessing. How do we crack in this position? Why can't he take the knight? Ask yourself. And then you might find the move. Why can't black take that knight? If black takes the knight, what do we recapture with? Nobody knows. If black take okay, never mind. If black takes this knight at g5, we would recapture with the h pawn because we have a true. Yes, Marty. Very yes. Peter Murray does it again. Wow, that is one of the coolest moves I ever came up with, and I was very proud of myself. I thought I had all the variations worked out to mate. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Suddenly, Black started playing pretty good. He found a move I didn't anticipate. Um, I, and let's take a second here. Anybody have any idea what Black maybe should try to do? I feel pretty dumb that I really didn't realize this was practically a forced move. In fact, this game may be why my wife left me. Yeah, Rook H1 is obviously the idea. Black played Queen E8. And I spent an entire night in my uh, chess room. Hours and hours and hours. You know, it was funny. I had given up. And then I, I went to bed. And as soon as my head hit the pillow, the thought popped in my head. I said, excuse me, honey, I'll be right back. And four or five later, uh, hours later, I came back with a magnetic chessboard to show her, hey, look, it works in every variation, but she wasn't impressed. 
<laughs> All right. Then G4, of course. Now, I was hoping I'm going to take that and play F5. That's the thing is we have to be prepared for F5 because, again, we cannot trade queens. The attack is over. So, again, like Miyagi Masurin, my opponent cracked under the pressure. I can't believe he did this, but he took with a bishop. So, obviously, I took with a pawn. And now F5. Okay, guys, what's the big finish? He actually offered me a draw here, saying that I had gone from a perpetual check to perpetual queen. Yeah, well, it's a little too early for that, Sasha. We have to be more forceful. You can't. Yes, Nenad Rabula. Superstar. Knight takes h6. Boom. And he takes g takes h6. And here's the movie missed. Yeah. No, 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 no. You cannot take that pawn. But the beautiful thing about the queen trade is he missed the Swishkinzug. G6. And then he had to play queen e7. And then we got bishop takes h6. And uh, rook c8. And the whole point, rook h1. Now, the cool thing about this game, we were willing to sacrifice both knights. Hey, no problem. Now, in order to win, white has to sacrifice both bishops. So, knight of eight. Knight takes e5 is really no different. And what do we do here? Mm. Bishop f8. And then and then the uh, then the next move. And that's, that's checkmate at h8. So he actually went for the knight e5. And if he goes queen f6, g7 kills him. No, oh, queen f6. There's a pawn there. What the heck am I doing? Okay. What am I doing? All right. Knight takes e5. Let's go back. Knight takes e5. Bishop takes f5. Yep. Knight d3. And then bishop f8. So that, that was a nice way to end the game. All right. Now, I'm going to... Let's see what we have here. We have... Oh uh, boy, 19 minutes. Now I go to games. What else do I have loaded? Oh, we do have this one. Okay. I'm going to go through this one really quickly because, again, I stole another idea from this game. And my friend Ron Henley said it was actually one of the best ideas he's ever seen. All right. This game was played in uh, when Bobby was a kid in New Jersey. And he started with knight f3 again. I, I, it's better to start with e4. Just to nail down the center. But back then, Bobby didn't do that. And now we have the standard uh, kings in the attack against the uh, Sicilian. I played this against Gadir a million times. Uh, d6. 
a4. Now a4 is a very important move. You uh, want what white wants to do. Hey, we're actually playing with a plan again. And this plan hasn't, I haven't seen a whole lot of players that know about this. Um, I learned about it from Gary Sanders, who learned about it from Roy Oster, who learned about it from Bobby. So we call this the secret variation. Yeah, we want to play knight c4. So a4 is essential. But what do we want to do after knight c4? I had a tough time getting my players to understand this whole theme. So I used the example. Yes, Rogov. Rogov knows. And Rogov, why do you know that? Because I use uh, violence in all my descriptions. I use the example of the Alfred Hitchcock movie, Strangers on a Train. Where strangers meet on a train and they talk about doing a murder. But the reason you get caught with murder is because uh, uh, you, you don't have an alibi or motive. So uh, the idea was uh, you do my murder and, and I'll do yours. So what the knights are going to do is the same crisscross. The, 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 the sinister guy in the movie kept saying, crisscross, crisscross. So that's what we're going to do with the knights. The knights go to C4, and the knight on F3 is going to D2. Then the knight on C4 is going to E3. The knight on D2 is going to C4. It's like they're doing a dance. Uh, Black will probably not have a clue what we're doing. But the whole point is to plant the knight in D5, and then the other essential move. The whole point of this whole maneuvering is the pawn break. Yeah, Murder Cross. And that's also in a uh, Billy Crystal movie with Danny DeVito. So, uh, throw Mama from the train. Anyway. Rick B8. Doesn't really do anything, but it's better than what my opponent played. Knight C4, B6, and now Bobby went for E5. Now, this is a little different than my game. Bobby decides just to get the example, uh, the advantage of the two Bs in this game. And that's exactly what just happened here. And Bobby is devastating with the two Bs. And he won this game. Uh, not one of his more brilliant games. But we can see Bobby went on to win. Kind of has an inevitability about it. And as I said, Bobby's devastating with the two Bs, and he cashes in. All right, enough of that. So. I came up with the same position, remarkably, against a former Chess Stars employee, Liza Orlova. I hadn't played a correspondence chess in a long time, but Liza was challenging the world. She was playing a world simul. Amazing. I thought, well, I got to try this. <laughs> so we started out. Same as Fisher Green, except I started with E4. And this is all simple stuff. Everybody's waiting. And the A4 move. And again, like I said, that's a very essential move. Why is it in play a very good move here? I can't say that it lost to the game. Or maybe it did. It's pretty close. Uh, she played Bishop D7. So I thought, wow, I've, I, I can handle this. So, of course, we play knight c4. And she followed up with b6. I think queen c8 might have been better. So now I, I, I almost played e5 like Bobby did. But again, when it's a correspondence game, I try to squeeze as much juice as I can out of a position. So I, I think I found a better move here. Anybody have a clue? How uh, maybe white has a better move than e5. I think Ricky one makes e5 even stronger. Oh, did I just, I'm 
Go back. Oh my God, Mike. Let's go back here. All right. No, 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 no. Come on, Mike. Ricky won. There we go. All right. And she played Rook B8. And of course, now, E5. And we have exactly the same position as Fisher Green, East Orange, New Jersey, 1957. With the notable exception that Ricky 1 and Bishop D7 have been played. Only difference in the position. So I, I think this is even better for White. She took. Take with the knight, of course. She takes. I take. And she lets me have the bishop. Rook c8. Wasting a tempo. I, I got furious. I you know I I get very angry during my games. <laughs> I thought she wasted a tempo moving the rook twice and she's giving up the light squared bishop. Nobody can do that and survive. So while I almost bagged the bishop, as in Fisher Green, I thought, wait a minute, there might be something even better here. And Ragov is absolutely correct. A5. This is a remarkable move. Look at what this does for the Fiend Kettled Monster Bishop of G2. And look at Black's Pawns. As a matter of fact, I think this is almost queening by force. But you got to find a nest, uh, a beautiful swish concern. Rather than dealing with the Shattered Pawns, she deferred the decision and played B5. Hmm. So, again, black is uh, making moves that aren't very productive, which are kind of tempo-wasting. So, as Mr. Kelly Naraman just pointed out, the crusher from Russia, C4. Now, she can't really ignore that one. Why? What is the lever with C4? Can't she just defer her decision again? Well, that's what she did. However, there's a problem. And what is the solution, guys? I love these moves in the uh, King's Indian attack. That uh, spring, it's like a coiled spring with the energy building up. The whole point is d4. Now we got a three on two on the queen side. And... Black spawns are devastated. So she took a d4. And if she had played knight g4, this is the move I was concerned about. She didn't play knight g4. She played uh, bishop e6 and blew another tempo, which I thought was kind of funny. But knight g4 is actually pretty complicated. Had she played knight g4? Hmm. What am I doing? Oh, I get to make a move first. Sorry. Queen takes d4. <laughs> what are you doing, Mike? Okay. Queen takes. Now, knight, sh she played bishop e6. Knight g4 is super complicated. Our only answer to that is bishop f4. And again, we don't want to trade a lot of pieces. Knight takes e5. Bishop takes e5. f6. And then we go back to f4. Are we making progress? Hmm. Let's find out. Yep. 
Yeah, and the whole point is Rook E D one, the option of colored bishop ending would be a draw. I didn't want that. E five is box. Queen D five check, of course. Rook F seven. Box. This should be three. Queen e8. And then queen d2, and I think we got plenty of chances here. But this definitely would have been her best route. I think she had, would probably have to play bishop c6 here. I would certainly play bishop d5. Not rook c1 or bishop takes c6, no way. And then um, takes takes. Bishop f8, rook a d1. Rook c6, b3. We got a protected pass pawn. I think we're doing fine here. Rook a6. And then c5. And this looked pretty good to me. I mean, what's she going to do? Queen b5? And I figured queen e4 would be good enough. So, that's, uh, I got zillions of variations of all this. And that's how I prepare and just spend a ridiculous amount of time looking at variations. But I think that would have been our best shot. Now, instead, <clears throat> wait a second, I get to do this, don't I? Played bishop e6. Queen takes d4. She played bishop e6. There we go. So how do we continue from there? Well, I, I actually hesitated about taking the pawn. I really uh, didn't want to get bogged down on material yet, and I had such a significant advantage. But uh, she played bishop takes pawn. I mean, that's equivalent to resignation. Not a good idea. Obviously, we t uh, knights moved backwards, too. Oh, why did I do it like that? Rook takes. And then a second pawn. Uh, I really didn't think I was greedy. The whole reason about that move... You have a plethora of winning moves here. And sometimes the most difficult thing to do is to win a one game. A6 might be even better because of the rapid threat of pawn promotion. But I did not want uh, ugly counterplay to rear its head. So the whole point of this move... After queen d4, made my task pretty easy. I definitely want to stop ugly counterplay so the queen can come back home. And that just takes away all hope. She doubled her rooks. I got my last piece out finally. Peace out, baby. And the queen moves. And now the pawn gets to run. She 
She might have tried maybe Rook E4 and Knight G4 here. This Rook C2 doesn't really put up a lot of resistance because of what do we do? Anybody have an idea? We take it. Because we got another one coming. Boom. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Now she's got to go back and uh, try and stop it. And we bagged the other Rick anyway. She still didn't quit. And Bishop D2, Disco. And there she gave up the ghost. Okay. Well, I had a lot of other stuff prepared, and I took quite a bit of time um, making sure that I outlined the idea behind Fisher Miyagmasurin, because seriously, you understand that one game. That is the most instructive game of playing the entire uh, system of the King's Indian attack, along with the uh, crisscross idea which I've never heard anyone really uh, describe it before. But uh, my, my players like Raghav uh, definitely enjoy the uh, correlation to crisscross. Yes, the knights do each other's job. And uh, the, the plan is to get in F4. And I didn't get to do that against Liza. So that was kind of cool. Um, normally we're weak on the queen side. And here in the queen side, we were winning. Anybody have any questions? Anybody still awake? All right, well, it's 3.59. I definitely enjoyed doing this uh, lecture. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keeler. Again, any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Thank you, Victor, mi amigo. Muchas gracias. Thanks, you're off the air.